in your U.S. history book in chapter 19, section 3, Education and Social Reform. In this uh, part of the chapter, we're going to be talking about public education, Chautauqua movement, well, we'll find out what that is, the temperance movement, and keeping the public informed. Here we have some pictures of the Chautauqua movement. We're going to have that to do with the teachers, right? And public education. I love some of these pictures here. So let's begin. Public education. So public education was under the influence of the Bible. And it became uh, education for children, you know, from the beginning of America, really. And, and prior to that, you know, uh, the Bible was very important. And so still at this time, the Bible was in the schools. Um, the rapid progress started happening with better transportation because the kids could get to school before they had a lot of education in their homes. So the increase in the public school system, though, gave a decrease in illiteracy. Most of the uh, children then in America were beginning to learn how to read and write. The advance in secondary education in 1800, what are you talking about secondary? That means high school. In 1800s, uh, a thousand schools um, were um, in America. In the 1900, there were 6,000 schools, high schools. Public kindergartners started in St. Louis in 1873, and by 1800, there were 400 kindergartners, kindergartens, I should say, in the United States, kindergarten schools for kindergartners. By 1900, 90% of the Americans could read and write. 90% were literate. Here's some pictures. I love this picture. This is of an Indian, Indian schools. All these are Indians coming into Philadelphia for school. Hmm. And so, in a lot of these other little schools here, you can see a uh, kindergarten school up here for the kindergartners. Moral values in school. Of course, there was Bible reading at this time and prayer in school. Also, character training in the midst of school and patriotism. The McGuffey readers, here's a picture of McGuffey readers, were based on the Bible um, for a grammar school. And in 1892, Francis Bellamy, picture of him here, um, wrote the Pledge of Allegiance. And it started being um, used in school. And um, basically every day would start with the Pledge of Allegiance. In 1900, it was read each morning and actually added onto under God. And no nation is good without God's blessing. We know that. So the Pledge of Allegiance to my flag, or to my flag and the Republic for which it stands. One nation indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Adult education um, started before this time, but the Chautauqua movement um, became very important for adult education and teachers. So earlier times, the lectures would come through town and toward the towns, and then when the lectures came, everybody would come, adults would come and listen, right? And the public libraries became a place to meet, uh, and they multiplied after the Civil War, and so a lot of adults went to the library and a lot of children too. So, but uh, during this time was this Chautauqua movement and the Methodists, um, uh, John H. Vincent and Lewis Miller, these two guys got together and they gave a two week conference or training session for Sunday school teachers. And it was on the shores of Lake Chautauqua in New York state. And they charged $6 per day, which include food and fellowship. So it was kind of a lot at that time, but of course, um, the adults and the teachers wanted to come and they felt like they needed to get together. The first time, 40 teachers came and then it became an annual event and the, the city of tents would come. There'd be, uh, you know, thousands of teachers coming with, and putting up their tents so that they could come and get together at the Chautauqua movement at this time. And it became important, especially for teachers, so they could find out um, what they, how and what they were teaching in the schools. Also during this time, the temperance movement. 
So what do you think of temperance? No, it's not your temper. A temperance has to do with alcohol. Because after the Civil War, there were a lot of alcoholics, you can imagine, as a lot of men coming back to the war would start, you know, maybe they're going through PTSD or whatever, but they would, they would start drinking alcohol. So um, there became a national prohibition party in 1869 to um, not allow alcohol or people to drink alcohol. Frances Willard, the lady, and she was a, um, she was a teacher actually with D.L. Moody's Women's Group, and she gave up her career as a teacher and also she was a college administrator at this time so that she could give out pamphlets on the, the, um, the detriments or, or the negative aspects of alcohol, right? And so she take, took these pamphlets to educate the public on alcohol and um, on the hazards, education in the public schools on the hazards of alcohol. Here's some pictures wet or dry, and they have this guy here, and it says, vote for dry for mine. You know how, uh, shall mothers and children be sacrificed to the financial greed of labor traffic? And basically saying, of, of, in the midst of, of temperance, wet means you can have alcohol, and dry means you not. Here's some pictures here. These women says, lips that touch liquor shall not touch ours. <laughs> so here's a picture of Mrs. Miss Willard, you know, Frances Willard. Up here it says, um, a noted temperance man lies here, the green turf for his his head, no man e'er show him his beer. Anyway, it's saying how a lot of, pe lot of men were dying of um, alcoholism. Keeping the public informed, newspapers. The newspapers educated, informed the people of all of our new technology, right? all of their new technology at the time. The people wanted to find out, and that's how they got their information, is from the new local newspaper. The web press now could print on both sides of the paper at the same time. Linotype machines cast rows of type with molten metal so they could get the message out quickly. And then of course, wood pulp for paper was now at a reduced price so they could get newspapers out. The telegraph networks also brought in the news in minutes. And so in minutes, the papers would, the, the papers would be available you know, for the next day. And so uh, you would actually have the editors you know, coming in um, for the newspapers and putting the news on the paper. Uh, the costs were offset by advertising. So basically, um, they had to have the costs set so they would have to advertise and pay for advertising, which they did. The new newspapers in 1880, uh, 971 newspapers. Um, they had weekly and semi-weekly paper in America. And newspapers in 1900, just 20 years later, they had 2,226 newspapers for weekly and semi-weekly. And um, the pastor Talmadge, D. Uh, T. DeWitt Talmadge, this is what he said. He said, the newspaper is the great educator of the 19th century. There is no force compared with it. It is book, pulpit, platform, forum, all in one. And some of the newspapers would actually put together and write out Talmadge's and other pastors' sermons and put them in their newspapers. <coughs> some pictures here gathering the newspaper. Here's one with Lincoln. Way back goes at Lincoln's time. Lincoln shot. Here we have um, we have a. Uh, newspaper, the boys would get out and give out the newspapers for the morning. Joseph Pulitzer, he lived 1847 to 1911. He was a Hungarian immigrant, but he worked in the newspaper business when he came to America, and he was one of America's best known newspaper publishers. In 1883, um, he bought the New York World um, newspaper. In one year, it sold 100,000 copies daily. In 1890, 1 million copies daily. Now in 18, it went from 100,000 copies daily and then on to 1 million copies daily. Oh, that's a lot of copies. The, the news appealed to a wide reading audience. Politicians wanted the newspaper, businessmen wanted the newspaper, and even common laborers and, of course, American families. They all wanted to get their newspaper to see what's going on in the world. 
Later on, Pulitzer um, will put together the Pulitzer Prizes Award for Journalism, Literature, Drama, and Music. And we still have those Pulitzer Prizes. Joseph Pulitzer. On to William Randolph Hearst. He was Pulitzer's rival. Hearst was quite a colorful character, that's all I have to say. He lived 1863 to 1951. They call his journalism yellow journalism because sometimes he didn't, he kind of, you know, um, wouldn't tell the whole truth on things. So that, that was a, or not that, not the whole truth, but he'd be exaggerating some things in there. But also, he also put the weekly sermons of Talmadge and Henry Ward Beecher in his, in his newspaper and also the news of when revivals, moody revivals would come. In the great 19th century missionaries, he would talk about them in his newspaper, including David Livingstone in Africa. And people would want to see, what, what about Stanley and Livingstone in Africa? So people were very interested in what was going on in the world in Christianity. Later on, Hearst became very, very wealthy, and then he ended up losing all of his wealth. Um, they called you, there's a movie called Citizen Kane about his life or whatever, but he ended up having one wife and then another wife at the same time and a, a lot a lot of weird, weird things with the Hearst family. But if you go to San Simeon in um, California, um, on the coast of California, you'll find the Hearst Castle there. It ends to, it's now just a tourist, um, it's owned, owned by this, um, the state, you know, parks and it's a tourist attraction, but it, it's very beautiful. But he ended up towards the end of his life losing practically everything as he gained, became very wealthy and then not. But anyway, William Randolph Hearst, you can look up his life. Okay, section, um, going on to section 19, three, the second part, fine arts and literature, to start off with um, Mark Twain. Of course, we know about Mark Twain. He's the one that labeled the Gilded Age, right? He lived 1835 to 1910. His name wasn't Mark Twain. His name was Samuel Longhorn Clements, and his nickname was Mark Twain which he was raised in the Missouri near the Mississippi River, and they would say, Mark II, Mark II on the ships, and he took in that name, Mark Twain, which means two. And he traveled west into Europe and the Middle East. He traveled actually um, on in most, of the, most of the world. We think of he was in Israel before, before Israel was anything big at all. And Cause said, well, you know, go to Jerusalem, there's really nothing there, you know. But anyway, he wrote The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer and many other books. And he um, basically became um, very uh, realistic and with vocal color in the midst, and he's known as the greatest writer during this time. He had a lot of bitterness in his heart towards Christianity. You know, I don't know if he ever became a Christian. He might before he died, but he was kind of embittered by the way he was treated, possibly in his past. I don't know. But anyway, um, he also had, I have to add there, you will find out about um, President Grant's memoirs. He published President Grant's memoirs, and we'll find out later on about that. So, um, he, like I said, his writing was very realistic. It depicted life without embellishment. You know, he basically said, this is the way we talked, and this is the way they lived. And war was not glorious anymore, but it was a necessary evil. That's what he thought. And characters spoke just as people did with their regional dialects. Um, the local color would be the particular regions. They would have that culture and that accent and that tradition. So he presented this local color, you know, um, to in his books. And these books were read by the whole country. They became very popular. Christian literature at this time, Ben-Hur. Ben-Hur became a, a book. It was written by General Lewis Wallace here. Here's a picture of me. This is not in his general suit. This is when he was young. But he was a Union veteran. He was a general under um, Ulysses S. Grant. I mean, we talked about the Civil War. You know, he was famous um, hero general. And to write a book like Ben-Hur, a Christian book, seems like an enigma, but he did. Um, it was a tale about Jesus Christ, and it was followed by a Judean slave. You have to see the movie, huh? Ben-Hur, a great movie, great book. Um, he sold two million copies of his book, 
It became the most popular novel in the United States. And he, in fact, when he was getting all the information together about his book and researching how to write it, talking about the time of Jesus and the resurrection, he became a Christian born again when he was writing his book. Isn't that the way it always happens? You know, they start researching and researching about the resurrection. It's going to lead you to Jesus Christ. Another Christian book is In His Steps by Charles Monroe Sheldon. And I think I'm going to have, we're going to be reading that this year. And it was written clear back in 1897. And it's a devotional classic. And it's about one fictitious American town is totally turned around. How? With the thoughts on what would Jesus do? For that year, everyone thought every day, what would Jesus do? Well, this, uh, this devotional classic sold three or 30 million. We saw Ben Hur, 2 million copies, 30 million copies now were sold worldwide. And it was translated into 20 language in his steps by um, Charles M. Sheldon. He was, a, he was a pastor. So we have a general, union general, and a pastor, Christian literature. Poetry. So the poetry at this time, uh, there's three of them here, but there's quite a bit of poetry that came. Poetry hadn't been too prominent before this time, but now it became um, very widely read. And we have this guy, Walt Whitman. He wrote, oh, captain, my captain, or when the lilacs last in the dooryard bloomed, have to do with President Lincoln at that time. And so everyone wanted to read his, his um, uh, poetry on Lincoln. Not really, he wrote Leaves of Grass. He was very much of a transcendentalist, you know, uh, naturalist and stuff. He wasn't really a Christian. But when he wrote about Lincoln, everybody wanted to hear his poetry on Lincoln. And he became famous for his other poetry too. Sidney Lanier right here, um, he, 1842 to 1881, he was, in, he was of Georgia. He was actually uh, a Confederate down, uh, you know, up during that time, but he was a dire Bible believing um, man. And he wrote a lot of uh, Christian poetry during this time, which became uh, famous in the South and in the North too. And then of course we have Emily Dix Dickinson and Emily, she lived in New England. We're talking up there, you know, by Massachusetts and, you know, the Connecticut, that area. Well, so, um, and she uh, wrote so many poems, it's ridiculous. And she had a lot of wit and passion and humor in her poems and everybody wanted to read them. But she didn't, pu she didn't have her pub publish her poems at all. She just kept them until after she died, her sister decided to publish them all. And she had like 2,000 poems. Now she was very, she was a very um, introvert. She stayed in isolation in her home and wrote a lot of poetry. But now we have her poetry to enjoy. Um, Emily Dickinson. Naturalism again. Jack London, another naturalist, um, even more of a naturalist than um, we had Walt Whitman and the transcendentalist. Uh, he was very much. Um, he was a Californian you know, um, uh, raised like San Francisco um, during, during this time, 1816 to 1916. He was a very strong evolutionist. Um, he believed that human animals, um, basically we are human animals and that we are controlled by our environment. We have no free will, we are just animals. Kind of sad, huh? He had a really sad life, you know? He was an atheist and he died young. So, but his writings become very famous, especially his writings about his struggles in Alaska and the gold rush. I think there's um, quite a few, uh, there's even some movies that have come out about that. So he wrote his, his struggles in the gold rush and about um, his animals, letting animals and, you know, all these things that happened there became very famous during this time. Call of the Wild, one of them. So Jack London. Yeah, he had like, he had one wife that he had children with, and he had another wife, and I don't know. They were at the same time, <laughs> without get, you know getting divorced. But anyway, the historical writing from some Southerners. Of course, we have Jefferson Davis. Remember, he was the president of the Confederates, and he actually wrote a book that a lot of people wanted to read, although it wasn't popular until just recently. Actually, why the South lost the war, you know, and the rise and fall of the Confederate government, and Jubal A. Early. 
1816 to 1894, became a Southern Historic Society a writer for history of the South. And this too was not really popular until the 1960s because they, they thought that both of these writers were not critical of slavery. Art, art during this time um, was a shift to being more realistic from romantic. Remember we have the impressionist arts and stuff back then. Now we have a shift more realistic, bringing forth what America, America's life was about. Um, tonalism was like this subdued misty tones in the midst of it. And I don't see very much here of that, but that would, they, a lot of the art at this time had these misty tones to it. James McNeil Whistler, um, became a, a famous writer, a, a famous artist at this time, 1834 to 1903. Here's a picture of his mother, Whistler's mother. Very famous painting. Looks pretty realistic, huh? Frederick Remington, 1861 to 1909, um, became another true-to-life illustrations of the West. Whenever I think of Remington, I think of cowboys and Indians, and indeed, he, he, he did a lot of art on, on cowboys and Indians. And, and wagon trains and living in the West. So here's some pictures here. I think this is a Remington, this is a Remington, this is a Remington. And then we have Courier and Ives. Nathaniel Courier lived 1813 to 1888 and James Merritt Ives, 1824 to 1895. And they had basically just a pictorial record of, of the towns and the cities of the nation's life. Here's some pictures of, you know, um, Christmas time and the snow and, you know, all of these are very famous, famous um, paintings of American life, you know, um, at different celebrations, especially during the winter times. Curie and Ives are very famous paintings and go for a lot of money. So do Remington's, they all do. Uh, and uh, um, James Whistler, well, you know, it's pretty much impossible to buy his. Architecture. Architecture. Um, so it went from uh, more of a Gothic revival of the medieval times and Victorian times. And to, now we have Lewis Sullivan in 1856 to 1924. And he's the father of the modern skyscraper now. So he had to use this hydraulic, here's a picture of the hydraulic elevator to, to go up and building these. And he believed form ever follows function. So he said, it's most important that our building functions well and that we can use it well. The function, if we're gonna have a tall building, we need great elevators, right? And he said, we built, we built needs no frills. He, or well built, I said we built. Well built needs no frills. And of course he builds, but anyway. This is the architect um, Henry, um, Lewis Henry Sullivan. So we have the skyscrapers. The City of Beautiful movement happened at this time, and uh, there was a white a replica of a white city in 1893 at the Chicago World's Exposition, and it showed these magnificent buildings and the shorelines all in white marble and what cities should look like now. Um, the, the, these, these different um, park scenes during the expo that were designed you know, a lot of them designed by Frederick Law Olmsted, who lived 1822 to 1903, um, now are, were put forth for different cities in designing their cities and putting forth parks and um, beautiful areas for people to walk in in the midst of city life. And he designed Central Park. As you can see here with Central Park, in the midst of all the skyscrapers and all of the, the buildings, we have a beautiful park. So people get away in the, in the midst of the city life and just walk in the park. This was the city beautiful movement. Some pictures here of um, what, how cities should look. Here's, here's a picture of him later on. This is when he was younger. This is Frederick Olmsted later on. And he's like, I just love walking through the flowers and walking in the forest and through the parks. <laughs> Music at this time. There was a new appreciation for music during the Gilded Age. Um, basically, they were teaching music in the schools now, and even the colleges were, te was, were teaching different um, how to play different musical instruments and how to read music. In the concert halls, symphony orchestras were being um, pl 
played in the concert halls and many people came to hear these symphonies during this time. In fact, the phonograph was invented by Thomas Edison now and they could actually take the music home and listen to the music at home with the records and the phonographs. They could listen to symphonies. They could listen to the, the new music that was there. And one of the new musicians at that time was John Philip Sousa. And he actually had marches. So you could actually bring, bring home the marches and march around your house if you wanted with this patriotic music. John Philip Sousa wrote um, Stars and Stripes Forever, which is a really famous march. So you had those marches, but we also had in the church a lot of new hymns. One of the most famous hymn writer is Fanny Cos Crosby. Um, Fanny um, Crosby, it's not Cosby, it's Crosby. But anyway, Fanny Crosby wrote over 9,000 hymns. She lived 1820 to 1912. She more, wrote more hymns than any other person in history. She was blind from infancy, so she probably listened to everything really a lot, you know? She was, bl she was blind since she was a baby, and she just had a knack to write hymns and to write the music, and she wrote 9,000 of them. And they started singing them in many churches, and hymns became very important uh, in worship in many, in many churches and at home. Thomas Nast, he lived 1840 to 1902. Well, what did he do? He was the father of American cartoons or cartoon drawing. We didn't have many cartoons up until Thomas Nast. We think of 1840s, some, but again, he put forth the cartoon for political cartoons. He was very, his cartoon set up for um, abolition, which means he was against slavery and he saw that free men were treated poorly, so he put together um, political cartoons that presented these things, these issues. Um, also in presidential elections, he brought forth um, uh, many of these political cartoons, and he uh, it was in covering corruption in politics and the demise of Tammy Hall and the political machine, Boss Tweed, all these things. He would put them together in a cartoon where people could say, oh my goodness, What's going on here? See, and it'd be a satire on his, um, on his cartoons. In 1886, Theodore Roosevelt appointed him as a counselor to Ecuador, and he did die. Imagine going to Ecuador. He probably got yellow fever, and he died in 1902. But his cartoons brought forth important issues. In fact, when you see the Republican elephant and the Democrat donkey, he put those together in the midst. The Republicans being the elephant and, don and donkey. Here's a picture of a cartoon of himself, kind of shows himself in a cartoon. Here's a cartoon of what he thought Christmas was about. So many, and you know, they would go and get the newspapers and pretty soon the cartoons would become very popular in the newspaper. And so they start developing more kid-like cartoons. So that's it. So we'll go on to um, reviewing the presidents this time in just a little bit.